This is really funny because really, truly, Donna asked if I would do this. She said, we have this ladies retreat that we do. And I said, no. I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have two kids and I'm a teacher and my husband really likes me to be home and I, I, I can't, I'm sorry. And even as soon as I walked away, I totally knew that the Lord was, was <laughs> seriously? Are you kidding me right now? Um, because I grew up singing. I started singing when I was five with my mom um, and just kind of grew into worship ministry. So it was just funny that the Lord was like, I bring you this opportunity, you say no. I don't think you understand how this works. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to work on that. Um, so I just... Um, <laughs> I, I, want, I, want to, I want to read again Ephesians 1, 3, and, and then pray. Lots of prayer. So Ephesians 1, 3, you guys have heard it. By the time you leave, it'll be just running through your veins. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you so desperately, and we need your word, and we need to hear from you. So we just look to you. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are sufficient for every need, for every worry. And thank you that your word is living and active, and that you are alive, and you work in us and through us. And so, Lord, we just give you this time. Please, Jesus, would you speak? It's in your name we pray. Amen. I have to start out by telling you guys something funny. Um, I almost called Donna, almost texted her to say, what like, what is everybody sharing on? Because if any of you have ever worked with Donna, she keeps things really, like, open, right? And just whatever the Lord lays in your heart, you just go for it. And I, for the, if you're familiar at all with the Enneagram and personality types, I am a type one, um, which means I am a planner, and I like things to be structured and organized and everything in its place and as it should be, and we all know what's happening, so there are no surprises. <laughs> which is such a joke when you're serving the Lord because he just doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, no. As a matter of fact, I, through this experience, I am I'm growing to believe that the Lord has actually given me this personality as a joke on me. Um, he just, he, it's, it's very funny how he thinks, and I'm sure lots of you guys can tell the same, to tell the same story. You have plans. You know, the, many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps, right? And so I have been looking forward to this. I've been asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want? How, what, what do you want to say? And what do you want to show me? And all these things. And um, I've been crazy busy and I finally got to sit down and the Lord's been showing me lots of things as we go. Last night I sat down and I put it all together in my format, my type one preparedness plan for this because I don't speak. I talk a lot. I just don't speak at things. So I plan it all out. And I was all excited. I woke up this morning and told my mom, I was like, I'm really excited. I think this is going to go good. I, I know what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this, 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 and then it's going to be good. And then we sit down and Alicia gets up to speak. God told her the same things he told me. <laughs> And here I was thinking we had this special thing going, right? And I was like, mm, me and the Lord, we had some good times. And apparently he had that good time with her too. So some of this stuff that, that you're going to hear will be repeated. And I'm going to go ahead and trust that that's because the Lord just wanted you to hear it twice. And most of my notes, I don't know how they fit together anymore. So... <sighs> Who knows what will happen? This is why people give me a guitar and lyrics and charts and say, follow that, please. Don't go off script. So Donna, you get what you asked for. Ha ha. So here we go. The blessings of the Lord. Um, if I were to write 
my story in a book. I think I would probably call it, well, first I have to back up a little bit. My middle name on my birth certificate is legit Sunshine. And so everybody's always called me Sunshine. I know I smile a lot. My face usually hurts. It's a thing. It's fine. Um, so if I were to write a book, I would, I would have to call it Little Ray of Sunshine, The Girl Who Did What She Should. Because my mom and I have had a wonderful relationship from the word go. I have never rebelled. I, they got, my family got saved when I was four years old. And at the concert, right? Was it a concert when you all got saved? Ish? Okay. We'll pretend that it was. That's my mom, Stephanie. Everybody say, hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. So welcome to the conversation between my mom and I when I rehash all these things that I had planned yesterday. I promise. <laughs> Um, so my family gets saved and they come to know the Lord and I, they're talking about being saved and heaven and forgiveness and Jesus and the cross and God and all these things. And here I am four years old and I'm like, uh, sign me up. I want that. I want to be saved. I don't know what it is, but I want it. And so Jesus just captured my heart right away. And that has been that way my whole life. And so the girl who did what she should, which I think fits with that whole personality thing. I like to know what I should do and then execute that. And if we could all just know what we should do and do it, the world would be a much better place. <laughs> so that is how I've lived my life. Um, and I've learned lots of lessons through that. <laughs> so from this perspective of a girl who does what she should and really loves to do what she should... I thought it was interesting that in this letter that Paul writes to Ephesus, where he has spent so much time, you've heard, he was there for three years. He developed a relationship with Ephesus that he didn't develop with any of the other churches. And so he was a lot more free with the things that he said and these deep doctrinal truths for the church at Ephesus that he didn't get to get into with the other churches. Um, that's so right up my alley, right? I walked with the Lord my whole life. I love you, Lord. Let's go deep dive. And to think that, like Alicia said, 25-ish years later, Jesus would write a letter to Ephesus. And that letter would be so different, right? But the girl who does what she should, I know everybody, you know, you talk about the church to the letter, or the letter to the church in Ephesus in Revelation, and everybody knows that it's, it's the you've left your first love church, Right? But the part that stuck out to me was the first part of that letter. And so I wrote it here where Jesus says to them, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who, are, who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. This is a church that works hard. Labor is not easy. Labor is not just a, a thing you do. It's not paperwork, right? Like a labor is something difficult. And this church worked hard. And they tested the things that came across their desk. And their walk with the Lord was deep and mature and rich. And they knew the truth, right? And he says to them, you have persevered which means they must have had trials. They must have had problems. And I'm not a pastor's wife, but I understand it can be really, really hard, right? So they've persevered and they have patience. I would love to have some patience. <laughs> I would really like this. And you have labored for my name's sake, Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but when I hear the name of Jesus, it does something in my heart right? Like at a cellular level, I respond. And when I talk about there's power in the name of Jesus, it's legit. I love his name. And for his name's sake, for his reputation, for his glory, for all that he had done, they were working for his name's sake. And you have not grown weary. You've not become weary. I almost wish, I, I want that almost more than anything else. Could I just not be weary for a minute? So I read this letter that Jesus writes to Ephesus, and I think, that is what I want. I want to be like that. I want those words to be said to me. I want Jesus to be able to say that to me. 
And I know that he goes on to say, you've left your first love. And I know that Alicia addressed that already, that that is a concern, especially for mature believers who have walked with the Lord for a long time. It's easy to forget. And so if you would, stay with me for a minute because we're going to take that forgetfulness and we're just going to put it off to the side for a second because that's a real issue. Alicia spoke about that, and if the Lord has spoken to your heart about that, he's going to work in you, and it's going to be amazing, and I know that for sure. But I want to look at this from a different perspective because maybe some of you are like me, and maybe you're the girl who does what she should, and you love the Lord, and you have loved the Lord for a long time. And the Lord's brought you through some things. And so I want to share with you a little bit about the last 15 years of what life looks like for the girl who does what she should in being this type of believer, this type of mature believer. So I'm going to I'm going to try to go through this quickly because mom said don't take too long because it'll take forever. And it's true. It will take forever. I mean, probably, let's be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just going to go the last 15 years, right? Like my grown-up life. Um, I went to UCF I, because I wanted to stay close to home. I got accepted to UF, almost went there because I was a Gator all my life. Go Gators. And at the time, UCF, I probably couldn't even pronounce the word football. So I was going to be a Gator. I didn't know what I wanted to go to school for, and it, by the grace of God, his wisdom came into my heart, and I thought, maybe I should not choose my college based on football. <laughs> that might not be a good idea. So I chose UCF so that I could stay close to home. I wanted to spread my wings a little, but not too, not too far. I went to UCF, uh, thought I was going for music education, and all the music people at, my, at this particular college in this particular group, I don't want to judge all music people, but the music people there were really mean. So I did not stay there long. Um, I couldn't keep up. So I switched to elementary education. Because you know what I can keep up with? Little kids. I could do that, right? Figured there's a good chance I know more than them, so we'll do that. <laughs> right? And they can't tell me that I did it wrong because they're like 10. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't even know. Just stop talking to me. So went to college, got my degree in elementary education. I'm the first person in my biological family to go to college to graduate with a degree. So this is all new stuff, right? I'm doing what I should. While I was there, I met my husband, Ron, who was my all-time best friend in the whole wide world. We dated on and off. Our friends couldn't tell when we were on or off <laughs> because it looked the same to them. Um, and we were just trying to figure stuff out. So I, um, you know, in doing what I should and in, in establishing my independence, this last time that he and I broke up, I, we broke up and I said, um, he had a key to my apartment because I would lose my keys all the time. He had a key to my car. I'd lose my keys all the time. We both were following the Lord, so there was no weird stuff. But he had my ID. Like, I lost my driver's license, and when I found it, I gave him my extra copy so that when we went to the movies and stuff, he could get tickets at a student discount or whatever. Like, our lives were so intertwined, and I was going to be independent. So we broke up, and I said, don't call me. Don't text me. I cannot be your friend. I love you. You don't love me, and we're not going in the same direction. So that's that. And for three months, I didn't talk to him at all. It's the worst three months. And anyway, long story short, we get back together. He said, letting you go is the worst thing I ever did. Literally said those words. It was like Lifetime movie. And we got back together. We got engaged. We got married. Hallelujah. And to this day, he is my best friend. Um, so praise the Lord for that. We had our daughter, who could not be a more perfect kid. Like, I'm kind of... I mean, I am super blessed, no lie. I'm also a little bit like, <laughs> I mean, that was kind of my thing. So being obedient and being good and being easy, that was kind of my thing, and now you're taking it, but okay, <laughs> whatever. Children will strip you of your identity, so we'll start right away, no problem, right? So I have my daughter, she's amazing, very easy baby. Um, we, were, we had a great apartment. I had a great job. I worked across the street from our apartment. We decided to move closer to home because we were driving back and forth from Orlando to Merritt Island for church. Um, 
we built a house in Coco that was beautiful. Never would have imagined we could have done that. Um, we were young and dumb and didn't have any money. I'm a teacher, and he had worked at the same place since he was 17 years old. He doesn't have a degree. And so, oh, blessing of the century, we had this huge house, and it was beautiful. And I taught online, so I got to stay home with my baby. And, I mean, it, it was we had everything that a young couple could ask for. Super blessed. Um, had my son, who is awesome as well. Um, super cuddly, affectionate little kid. He is just so, so cool. Um, life was great. And this is really fast because I don't, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like this is some big dramatic thing. This is not a big medical dramatic thing, but really fast. Um, my husband developed some health problems that have led him to the place where now, where we currently are, um, he's, he has really bad health problems and he won't go to the doctor. And I love him and I just am not gonna nag him about it and push him and whatever. So I just pray and let the Holy Spirit talk to him. But the reality of my life is that my best friend in the whole world lives most of his life at home, he goes to work, and he is in great spirits, and he loves the Lord. Um, but very often when I leave for the day or if I come to something like this, I text him all day and will call him all day because there's a very good chance at some point, if the Lord does not do something drastic in his heart, um, that I will come home and probably find him having had a massive heart attack. And I'm afraid of that all the time. And he knows this. I've told him this. So if he ever listens to the tape or whatever, he knows um, that I'm afraid of that. And I have to give that to the Lord every day, that this blessing of a man um, could be taken at any minute. And I mean, that's true of all of our husbands and all of our, all of our families. So it's not, I know it's not a, a, an uncommon struggle. Um, we lost our house. Uh, we went through foreclosure because a bunch of job changes. I lost that job, didn't lose it, I left it, and it, it became an unhealthy situation, and I left the job that was paying all the bills. And um, we went through foreclosure, and very few people in my life knew about it, because we didn't really talk about it. So that was something that I went through by myself, kinda, um, with my family, and dealt with a lot of just spiritual struggles, trying to trust the Lord. I don't know why you won't fix this, God. I don't know why you won't provide for us differently. I don't know why you won't. You gave us this house, and we can't keep up with it. It's running away from us, and we're losing it. And we lost it. And um, my husband struggles with issues over that, that we are, are always taking to the Lord and, and constantly laying at the feet of Jesus, believing that he has given us everything we need, and if he's taken that home, it's because we didn't need it. And he is doing something, and so we look to him and keep moving, right? And we keep going. Um, my daughter is now 13, so her story is, is, is in development. Um, it's, it's in production as we head into the teen years. I will get back to you shortly on how that goes because so far, no major issues there. My 10-year-old son, um, we were at a school. I, taught, I was teaching at a school that he was going to and he went to preschool there and he went to kindergarten there. And um, by the end of kindergarten, he hated school and it was a private school. And the people there love Jesus. I do not doubt that for one second. And they love kids. I don't doubt that for one second. But what they didn't understand, and I'm an educator, formally trained and degreed and all of that. Um, he, doesn't, he just doesn't fit a mold, right? He couldn't sit still. He couldn't be quiet. He couldn't listen. And he was always in trouble, always, right? Uh, you moms of, of young boys, you know how that can be. They just, that's where they live, in the land of trouble. <laughs> and so that was not a big deal, right? Like I just figured that was par for the course. When you have a little boy, that's what you signed up for. And so we got through kindergarten 
um, his teacher by the end, and this, remember, I work with this woman because I work at the school. At that time, I was teaching him in the high school, and he was going to the elementary school. Um, by the end of that year, that kindergarten teacher, I wrote her one email. She left a bunch of papers in my box. I wrote her an email saying, I need your help. My son hates school, and I don't know what to do. I'm a teacher. It's breaking my heart. I didn't hear back from her, but long story short, she wouldn't speak to me unless the, we were in the principal's office. She wanted the principal there to have her back. I can't imagine why. She told me that she had nightmares because of my email that made her want to leave teaching after her very long career. And I'm going, what in the world? This is about my six-year-old who thinks he is a total failure. And you're going to make it about you. Okay. All right. I'm going to take this one to the Lord then because it's not going anywhere in the real world, right? Whatever, the physical world. So we go into first grade. Same troubles. That year he had four teachers. And um, this one particular day, my principal comes to me, because I, like I said, I was a high school, came to me and said, um, we got a sub to cover the rest of your day. We need you to take Ronnie home. And I said, excuse me? I mean, we are straight up hardcore Bible children raising people. Uh, we've been saved since we were kids. We spanked our kids. There was no messing around. Like, we were hardcore, and he was a great kid everywhere but school. Like, I know every mom says that, because I'm a teacher. I hear it. Every mom says that. But no, really, he really was. So I'm like, okay, what did he do? Well, he threw a chair and kicked a desk, because he was mad at his teacher. And this little boy's rage, I mean to tell you what, and it was always with school stuff. School, my safe place, right? This was like my whole life. And it was killing my kid. And I remember I took him home that day and we sat on the couch and I didn't even know what to say to him the whole way home because he is the sweetest thing and he's just so apologetic and didn't know what was wrong and why he was being sent. He didn't get it. And we sat on the couch and I didn't know what to say so I sat on the couch and I just pulled up Worship on YouTube. That's all I know, really. And um, Oceans came on. And I remember sitting on the couch with my, he was like seven or eight at this point, probably seven. And we just cried. And the more I cried, the more he cried. And he would cuddle up to me and hug on me and love on me and just, I'm sorry, mommy, I'm sorry. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was wrong. So I couldn't fix it. So as a mom, like total failure, my kid is failing, school is falling apart, and we're listening in oceans as a worship leader. For those of you who are worship leaders, you'll, you'll get this. There are songs that you sing and there are words that you say that if you ever stop to think about them are terrifying. And when you say, spirit lead me where my trust is without borders, when you say things like, take me where I would never wander, my feet would never wander there. I would never just wake up and go, oh, look at that. How this, huh, hmm. That would never happen because I pay very close attention not to go there. But in that song, as it's playing on the TV and I'm saying these things, I'm just bawling because I'm saying, Lord, I want that. But oh, it's scary when I don't know what you're doing. And I'm the girl who does what she should. So if you could tell me what I should do, I will do it. Please. <laughs> Nothing. Radio silence, right? Except I will be in the presence of my Savior. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And that's all I knew, was that if I'm in his presence, my faith will get stronger. So we press on, right? And we're in a much better school now. He's in a much better place. But at that time, there was one day when I went to lead worship. It was a Wednesday night, and I was leading worship with one of the other worship leaders at our church. And um, I went to go up on, no, we, it was before church was started, the kids weren't supposed to run around in the sanctuary. And I stopped him and I said, you can't run in the sanctuary. And he was instantly filled with rage. I mean, like, I have never seen an angry kid like this before. And he's fuming at me because I told him not to run. I'm like, what is wrong with you? And I figure, okay, he's tired. It's been a long day. It's a Wednesday, right? So we were at school all day. 
okay, so I, I already made this commitment to lead worship. I'm going to lead worship, and then we'll go home. So I, I go back in the back in the green room. He's, like, screaming at me because he doesn't understand why he's in trouble and why he can't go to class and why I won't let him do what he wants to do. And I put him in there with Shelby in this separate room, and I go into the room next to it to pray before service. And while I'm in there praying, I can hear him screaming at her. My seven-year-old is screaming his head off at my 10-year-old. And there are no grown-ups in there because we're getting ready to go lead worship. So I excuse myself from the prayer. <laughs> I'm worship leader. I'm sorry, I can't pray. I have to go discipline my screaming child. So I go in there and I'm like, you can't scream at her. You have to be quiet. Pull it together. We will leave. I promise. We will run away. But I've got to be faithful to what the Lord has called me to do. And then we'll go. I promise. And he goes and sits in the corner. There was like a little kitchenette. And he goes and sits in the corner and he's still fuming. And I go back in the prayer room. And they're done praying. And it's time to walk out on stage. And all of a sudden I realize, it occurs to me, there are knives in that little kitchenette. This is the craziest. I can't even like say these words because they sound absolutely insane. There are knives in that kitchen that, and it occurs to me, I don't know what he'll do. My 10-year-old little girl who is quiet as a church mouse and obedient and good as can be, she's not a teenager yet, is sitting there and my son is totally, I don't know what's going on with him. He is not himself and there are sharp things in there and there are no grown-ups. And I literally am walking up on the stage as I'm thinking all of this. And I told our other worship leader, I said, I'm so sorry. I have to go. I, I can't do this. Now, you got to understand, I lead worship through come hell or high water. I mean, there was one Sunday when we got the news five minutes before we walked out on stage that one of my very, very good friends had passed away unexpectedly. And it was just, hey, Don Hale died. What? okay, I'm going to go lead worship now. And I did it because you don't say no, right? Like when the commanding officer says go, you go. And that's how it is. And he sustains you and he always has. But in this moment, I knew, ooh, I can't. So I walked back off the stage and I got my kid and same thing, cried all the way home. So now school is a disaster. My child is a disaster. I have now abandoned leading worship and I know it was only one night, but for when that's who you are and what you do, it's a big deal. And I'm driving on the way home, and this is, this is the time when I decide I'm going to have it out with the Lord. All right, God, I've been trusting you for a long time, and it is time for some answers. <laughs> and I am crying, and he's just mad, and Shelby's just quiet, and I'm crying, and I don't understand this rage that he has. And there was nothing I could do. We had prayed. There were times when he would sit up in the upstairs of our house before we lost it, and he would scream, and we'd say, cry out to the Lord. It's okay. You can be honest with him. You can pour your heart out before the Lord. He loves you. He'll listen to you, saying all the right things, right? All the things that we do when we are at, at our wit's end. Told him all of that, and he would, he would sit in his room upstairs and scream at the top of his lungs to the Lord, where are you? Why won't you help me? I need you. Where are screaming and then screaming for us? Mommy, daddy, come back. Please come back. Come be with me. And we're like, we can't. We can't help you with this, buddy. You are going to have to work this out with the Lord. And we would sit downstairs and cry and cry and cry because we couldn't do anything. My kid is having a full scale spiritual meltdown and there's nothing I can do. And the Lord, from all that I can see, is not answering him. All of that, put on some worship music, read some scriptures, and fall asleep quietly while I rub your back. That was, that was long gone. And I remember asking the Lord this night, because this was the worst it got, and I, hey, suicide is a real thing. People lose their kids. And if any of you have gone through that, I cannot even begin to imagine how the Lord would have to sustain you through that because that night I looked at that as a situation in my life. And my kid's only like seven, eight years old at this point. And I asked the Lord, is that where we're headed? I just like to be prepared. So are you going to take my son from me? Because I don't see how this is getting better. And I've prayed for a long time and I've searched the scriptures and he's called out to you and we've done all the things that we're supposed to do and it's not getting any better. So is that where we're headed? Are you going to take my kid? 
Because if so, I need you to give me a heads up. Because I don't think I can handle that. And uh, he came. <laughs> God is so good. We have these full conversations. And he came back at me like a lion. And the picture in my head was Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia. And he came back at me, and I, oh, he was fierce. And he spoke so clearly into my heart and said, back off, back away. And I could picture him in my head. I'm a super visual person, and I could just picture this lion standing over my son. And I couldn't get to him. I couldn't help him, and I couldn't do anything about it. And here's this lion. And it is not a nice, soft, cuddly lion. It is a, I am the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he belongs to me. Back off. And the Lord showed me in that one instance how fiercely he loved my son. And he made it so clear to me, he is not yours. He is not yours to fix. He is not yours to, to whatever you think you're doing. He belongs to me. I am writing his story. I created him. My life verse took it, totally stole it from my mom, <laughs> is that, <laughs> okay, fine, we took it from the Bible, whatever. <laughs> Every day ordained for you was written in my book before one of them came to be, and God was very clear. I have written every, every single day for your son, and when I take him, it will be because I planned to take him, because he belongs to me. He is my Workmanship, my masterpiece, not yours. And I had to let go of him. And that was the scariest and most incredibly liberating thing I have ever done in my entire life. All that is to say, blessings do not often look like you think they will. Right? And you've heard testimony all day of, of things that the Lord has done in the physical that just didn't work out the way you expected it to. And so what do we do? Um, those blessings that we have, our homes, our kids, our friends, our families, all of those things, they are blessings from the Lord. But as this scripture says, our blessings, he has given us every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the blessing. He is it, right? And, the, and all that we have because of who he is, those are the blessings of Christ. And the things that he puts in our lives, the only reason he puts them in our lives is so that he can reveal himself to you. In that instance with my son, I realized that was never about Ronnie and it wasn't about me. It was about the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he was showing me how strong he is and how fierce he is and how very much in control he is. And I began to look at everything in my life not as this thing to hold on to or let go or even use in service to the Lord like I'm supposed to, but Jesus, what are you showing me about you, Lord? And so we go back to Ephesians chapter one and the rest of it, he says, these are the blessings, right? They're given to us in him. In this one little section of Ephesians, he says in him nine times, nine times in him. So what are the blessings that we have that we hold on to? It's this, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You are chosen, not an accident. You're not just floating through. You're not just getting by. You are chosen, the apple of his eye. And he sees you, and he sees your circumstances. He has given you those circumstances because you are chosen. Predestined us to adoption as sons. We have a place. We belong to him. He is our good, good father. 
We have redemption through his blood. We are redeemed from, from our sins and from our failures. We have forgiveness of sins. We will screw up. It's going to happen. Even the girl who does what she should, I will screw up and I will run to the Lord and he will wash me clean. I have that promise. And his grace abounds in all wisdom and understanding. I need that grace. He has made known to me the mystery of his will in Jesus, the mystery of his will. And his will is what? That we will be gathered together as one, all things together in Christ. I have the hope of heaven, and I have the hope of the body of Christ, that I am not alone, ever. And no matter what I lose, I have never lost it all, because I am bound together in him with the body of Christ. And nothing can take that away from me. Nothing can take that away from you. We have an inheritance, the hope of heaven. We have the Holy Spirit of promise. Our guarantee, oof, thank you, Jesus. Our guarantee until the redemption of the purchased possession. He purchased us and he has given us the Holy Spirit because he is coming back to receive us to himself. Right? All to the praise of his glory. It's who he is. That is his glory, that he redeems, he forgives, he restores, he chooses you, he holds you, you belong to him, nothing can change that, and he's coming back to get you. Those are the blessings that we have in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, that no one can take away. So whatever your circumstances may be that you're walking through, and no matter how tired you may be, because I get you, I am tired. <laughs> Jesus is enough. He sustains us in all of those things. And he is the blessing. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are for your promises, Lord, that you have made it so plain who we are in you and what you have done on our behalf, that you are the fullness. Lord, would you help us to abide in you? Help us, Lord, not to forget that you are it and that if we will run to you, even in our weariness and even in our emptiness, you will fill it and you will make it enough. Because if you have done all of these other things, why on earth would you stop short? So we come to you. We love you. We give you our lives, Lord. Every blessing that you have given to us, we give back to you. It all belongs to you. And we look forward, Lord, to seeing what you will do on our behalf in these circumstances, in these blessings, to show us your glory. So we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.